Um, our next talk will be by Robin Ersberger about voice control in action, a Python-based approach for operating a quadrupedal robot. I guess it's the thing you see there. And yeah, Robin finished his um, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering at OST, so the school here, and is now in his master's degree. And yeah, I'm looking forward to an awesome presentation about robots. So thank you, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Rafael, for this introduction. Yeah, let's just start and have a look at this this cute little guy back there. He's a little bit shy, so uh, please, please come here. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, this is my my little friend here. He's uh, a little bit shy, but uh, yeah, he likes people a lot. He doesn't walk into people. Uh, but he's a little bit noisy, so I'm going to turn him down just for the talk. Um, for the demonstration afterwards, we're going to power him back on. Uh, yeah, let's start to talk about robots. So this robot you can see here is a really cool guy. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a technical background about this robot, and then we're going to dive into the voice control. This robot, we have a picture here so that you can see him. He weighs around 32 kilograms, has a payload capacity of around 14 kilograms, runs for around 90 minutes, depending on how much payload we actually attach to this robot. He has a maximum speed of around 6 kilometers an hour and can walk up or down slopes of around 30 degrees. He can also walk up and down stairs, uh, which, make him, which makes him really, really handy in a lot of situations. Uh, as you can see here, we have a lot of stuff attached. I'm going to quickly talk about this stuff we have attached. In the back, we see the vision tower. The vision tower gives this robot additional perception. So at the top, we have a GPS antenna. Right at the bottom, like the next layer, we have a laser scanner, a so-called LiDAR. Using this laser scanner, we can measure distances in 360 degrees. Right below that, we have four cameras with overlapping field of view which enables us to generate a 3D image of the surroundings. So what we can do with this vision tower is we can locate the robot in the world, additionally to generating a map with a point cloud and also image information. The next add-on is the add-on you see here in use. This is our so-called spray add-on. With this spray add-on, we are able to spray herbicides. This little black thing with the cable at the end is a camera. And with this camera, we can detect weeds, and especially the, the leaves of the weeds we do not want. And we can spray only the leaves of the weeds, which reduces the amount of herbicide needed drastically. The last add-on I like to talk about is, uh, was a bachelor thesis during the same time as I did my bachelor's. It was uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, he made a drill add-on. The drill add-on is not attached currently. This is some sort of replacement of the spray add-on. And the drill add-on is, as you have probably guessed, a drill which is attached to this robot. This can be used to drill holes into walls and take samples, for example, in buildings that are dilapidated. So when a building is about to break down, we can send in this robot. He searches for points of interest, drills holes and searches for asbestos. This makes it really handy. This robot can walk anywhere a human can walk. But I'm not here to talk about the robot. We're here to talk about Python. So, um, yeah, the connection between this robot and Python is actually rather simple. Boston Dynamics provide a Python SDK. We can control this robot to a certain degree simply with Python commands. We only requi require Linux, Windows, or Mac OS. I use Linux because I like open source. And we need Python. Those are the officially supported Python versions. I also tested it up to Python version 3.10. This still works. Why wouldn't it? OK. Now, we want to control this robot. Here we see a diagram of what we actually need to do before we can command the robot to do stuff. The first and most important thing, I think, is the emergency stop. Emergency stop is needed such that the, when the robot does something we do not want him to do, we can stop him. Issuing the emergency stop immediately cuts off the motor power and the robot falls to the ground. You can either use the tablet I use here. 
this is the way I controlled the robot beforehand to issue this emergency stop, or you can have it run using a Python file. Um, it is not recommended to have the emergency stop in the same file as your other routine, because yeah, when your routine breaks, also the emergency stop breaks, and then you have some janky behavior of the robot. Like next, we have an authentication. We need to authenticate ourselves on the robot. This is simply done by issuing a username and a password, such that not everybody who's in the same network as this robot can access this robot. And last but not least, I want to talk about the concept of leases, especially lease clients. Uh, you're going to see the word client coming up next, and I want to give a quick introduction to what this means. Like a lease client is, you need to kind of lease the robot's body to control him. So I can, as for example, a path planning module, take control over the robot and tell him to walk over there. I need to give this lease client with my command, and then I'm allowed to make the robot move. When I don't have the authority to move the robot, the robot won't move, even when I issue this command. Once all this is given, we have a robot which is ready to execute commands. But now, let's talk Python. How do we issue commands? First, we need to build commands. This is done using a robot command builder clause. This clause has several methods. Uh, in this example here, we have the synchro stand command. This is a method which builds a command which makes the robot stand in place, but twisted. So looking up, looking down, having his body moved, but not his feet. Once this command is built, we need to issue the command. This is also done super easy. You can see we use our client, in this case, the command client. So a client which has the authority to command the robot to issue this robot command. On line two on the left, we see that we do not issue a lease. This is because our client we use in the first place already has the authority to issue commands. Uh, this is needed that, for example, when we have a client who is not able to issue commands, we can give him another lease and he can issue commands in the name of another client. This is yeah, some, some niche case stuff. Then we give him the command and we give him a timeout. Now this timeout thing, this is a, a little bit strange because not all these commands actually use the timeout even though it is required. Um, commands like, for example, stand up or sit down use it actively. So when the robot fails to stand up or sit down, he will throw an error and say, hey, I didn't manage to stand up. Other cases, like for example, trajectory commands, commands where the robot actually walks somewhere, they do not internally check this end time. They simply stop after the timeout. So we, as the user ourselves, need to control our timeout. This is, this is simply done by checking the command status. So while we're not in timeout, we check our status. If the status is still executing, we didn't reach a timeout, everything's fine, we can continue. Else, if we are at the goal, and the timeout isn't reached, we can return, we don't have an error, this is great. However, when we run into timeout, we need to handle this ourselves. In this case, we simply raise a timeout error, uh, we can raise other stuff, we can manage other stuff. This is simply needed, so when the robot runs into an obstacle during his normal trajectory command, we know that this robot isn't at the place we think he is, and this is the way we can detect that. And as you can see, this is quite complicated. Like, not every command is issued the same way, there's some weird behavior. So what I did during my bachelor thesis, I unified these commands. I made one virtual command class from which every other command derives. I'm going to quickly talk about these different commands. On the top left, you see full body commands. These are commands where the robot uses the full body, like, for example, standing up, sitting down, stuff like that. Power commands are all related to the power of the motors, so powering on motors, turning off motors, stuff like that. On the top right, we have our movement command, the trajectory command, makes the robot move in a plane, and the orientation command, which I've talked about before, is the command which makes the robot orient him himself in space. In the middle, at the bottom, you see the add-on command. This is a special kind of command which is not provided by Boston Dynamics. This is one we made ourselves. This is to control all the add-ons. 
like the simple add-ons we've seen before, the drill and the spray add-on, which just need a start and stop command. Um, we also made this add-on command inherit from the commands so that it, just because it is simpler to issue a command like that. Because as you can see, there are two methods which are really necessary. The is valid command, which checks, am I allowed to issue this command right now? This is checked with a state machine, so when the robot is sitting, he's not allowed to walk somewhere. Next, we have the run command, which is, yeah, as Python code documents itself. Sorry for the guys who weren't there during the documentation uh, talk. But run command simply issues the command to the robot. And what he returns is the next state is going to be an in, such that we can check if the next command is valid again. What this allows us is to have this robot command with simple JSON files. So what we can do is we can give this robot JSON files in any way which have the following keys. We need a type key to make the robot know which type of command he needs to do. And we need to, a priority. This is just for, like, for example, stop commands which need to be interrupting. And we need command-specific keys. Command-specific keys are, for example, for trajectory commands, coordinates, uh, for stand commands, for example, is to stand up, stuff like that. So yeah, this is what I did during my bachelor thesis. But in my master, in a project I uh, did in my master's, I actually made a voice control. And this is why we are here. I'm already halfway through my speech, and I'm not even starting with the speech. Let's speed up. For speech recognition, we need two parts. We need speech to text, so a way to translate our voice to text, and then a way to interpret our command such that, such that we have a command which can then be filled or serialized to JSON and sent to the robot. Briefly, speech to text, there are many modules. There are several cloud-based, which you can see here. There's the Google speech to text, OpenAI provides speech to text, Microsoft provides speech to text. These are, this is an incomplete list. Like every major tech company provide their own speech to text API. However, these are all cloud-based. This is not optimal because when we're out in the field, we don't always have fast internet connection. So what we were looking for is for a local algorithm, which runs on our machine. Uh, there are two. Uh, the top one, Mozilla DeepSpeech, um, developed by the Mozilla team. And the bottom one, VOSC, developed by Alpha Sephi. These are both Python APIs to models. So we can access this model, which runs locally using simple Python APIs to get our speech to text. I uh, did some testing. I'm going to rush over this. Um, we can see VOSC performed way better than Mozilla Deep Speech, a lower word error rate means a better word error rate. So it uh, means better performance, sorry. So yeah, uh, I used Vosk for this. So now we have our text. But how we get text into command? There are two methods, a keyword matching, which is like the simple method, and the deep neural network approach. This is some sort of this natural language processing, which you see in, for example, uh, OpenAI's GPT models and stuff. So first, let's talk about keyword matching. Process, yeah, it's, it's fast. It's super simple. You have a, a lookup table with keywords which refer to a certain command. It's super simple to implement. You just need to have your lookup table. However, it's error prone. I'll give you an example. If we want to look left, we don't know if the robot should just tilt his body or actually walk and move his body. So there's some like ambiguity in these, in these uh, keywords. And also, when you have conjugated words, we need to match basically every case. So look, looking, walk, walking, walked. Everything needs to be in this like corpus of keywords. Looking at deep neural networks, they give us the feeling that they can detect meaning out of our sentence. Uh, I think everybody of you has played with ChatGPT a little bit. So it seems like it can grasp about what we're talking about. It also handles misspelling and is really good at generalization. However, we have a computational overhead, which is not always great, especially when we're out in the field and we already have a speech-to-text model running. And we need training data. 
like lots and lots of training data. So we've looked at all these different methods. And after some testing, we found out, hey, keyword matching actually seems to work because there are not many ways to issue commands. Like this robot, to tell him to stand up, there are literally two or three ways to tell him to stand up. It's stand up or get up. And if you're really, really quirky, you can say rise. But <laughs> yeah, uh, this is basically it. You can't tell the robot to stand up in any other way. So we implemented that. It was super easy to implement. It worked out of the box. It worked great. However, uh, with more complexity added to the robot, especially more add-ons, more stuff to the robot, we realized, yeah, maybe keyword matching is not sufficient. This, this keyword engineering is getting to become really complex. Like we really tried to engineer our keywords and like our sentences in a way that he will understand us, which is not an intuitive way to command a robot using natural language. This won't be natural language anymore. So we implemented a slightly advanced keyword matching. The slightly advanced keyword matching algorithm uses TF-IDF, so-called term frequency inverse document frequency algorithm. What this does is simply look sort of at different sentences which belong to a command and tries to figure out himself which words are more important for certain commands. The return value is a specific function, uh, a specific command, or uh, a specific command, and a probability that it is this specific command. So when you have a probability of, let's say, less than 80% that it is to this command, we can simply tell, yeah, we did not understand what you mean. This is what you're probably going to see when I do the live demonstration. Um, yeah, prose is still fast enough. We need a few key sentences. And yeah, that's basically it. However, the, the disadvantages are, of course, uh, one thing I didn't talk about. Phonetic similarity. Phonetic similarity is a thing that where you, for example, tell a robot to power off motors. This sounds really similar to power off motors which refers to the power of motors. Uh, this doesn't make sense in this context, but the speech-to-text model does not know that. So this phonetic similarity is definitely something we need to look into further. OK, now we have our command type. How do we get information about our command? This is a typical sentence we could issue the command, the, the robot. Walk forward two meters, one meter to the left, and look left 10 degrees. How do we do that? But first, we can see, yeah, the walk part we have already figured out. We know we need to walk. Let's say this, our, our TF-IDF algorithm figured out we need to walk. Now, what we found out during testing is that all these words, like these direction hints and distances, they come in pairs, as you can see here. So either we have a direction hint first and then a distance, or the other way around, a distance first and then a direction hint. So what we did is we looked at the sentence, we went through it word for word, and tried to find either direction hints or distances. And when we found a distance first, as in the red case, we looked for the next direction hint, so these belong together, and as in the first case, when we found a direction hint, we looked at the next distance. This is the way we figured out how this robot like, coordinates, how we can extract coordinates out of sentences. OK, now the next thing you see is these, these number words. These are really bad, because we can't do math with, with number words. How do we get over this? Because like, you've probably, like, in, in English language, you have so many number words, and you have decimal points, and some are negative, some are positive. Um, how do we get over this problem from a word to a number? Now, there's a saying uh, in Python, there's a library for that. And this is what we did. There is a library for that. It's called word to number. It does exactly that. It's already implemented. So yeah, this is our complete pipeline, let's say, for commanding our robot. So what we can do is we can translate speech to sentences using models which run locally on our machine. We can extract commands from these sentences using TF-IDF. Then we can extract further information about the command and issue these commands using JSON files. 
So um, this is basically it. Let's quickly have a look at how this thing works in action. I brought a little video, um, just because I know I'm a little bit short on time, um, such as we have time for questions. If we don't get to the live demo in the coffee break, I'll be over there and give you a live demo as long as you want, like as long as the coffee break is. <laughs> but let's have a look at our little video. Hey Spot, execute startup sequence, confirm, walk forward three meters and right one meter, look right 90 degrees, confirm, Look up 10 degrees. Issue the command like that. Confirm. Sit down. This was it for my talk. Now we're going to wait until the robot boots up. If there are any questions, I'm open to questions right now. Thanks a lot. So are there questions in the room? Uh, over here we have one and in back as well. There are the helpers of the microphone. They're coming. <laughs> time is it? So yeah, Raise your hand. Time. I think we have a few minutes, yeah. yeah. Over there, yeah. <laughs> Turn it off again. Um, maybe to, to bridge this time, uh, what you've seen me doing during this like little demonstration, I always confirmed what the robot needs to do. I have a little visual output to see what the robot wants to do, and I always need to confirm the stuff the robot does beforehand. This is just an additional security thing. Um, we can think of removing that. Uh, you've seen it when I want to sit the robot down, I remove that, because sitting down is something that is quite important sometimes, and so the robot can simply sit down without confirming that he needs to sit down. Also the issue, the command like that thing is the robot tries to fill all his fields or all his keys, all his coordinates with numbers. So when I only want him to look up, I yeah, need to fill these other fields with zero. And yeah, this is what I do with issue the command like that. Now microphone works. Let's try it out. Yes, now microphone Perfect. works and you have already answered my question. That's oh, great. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, because I, I exactly wanted to ask, uh, like, why it sat down without the confirm, because it was, yeah, not that clear. But okay, but, but still, I can ask one more maybe question uh, regarding the uh, deep learning stuff. So you mentioned uh, th this point. So I, I didn't maybe, like, quite understood, like, was it finally used there uh, or you used, like, the standard uh, options for the controlling? Um. So if I understand your question correctly, like the, the way to issue these commands looks quite strange. And what I did during my bachelor thesis was like maybe an overkill, a wrapper around a already human readable interface. So yeah, um, for me, this way to issue commands was really undynamic. So you need to basically hard code these commands in sequence such as the robot does this thing. So for example, when you wanted to walk in a square, you could just issue this walk forward one meter turn right 90 degrees, you could issue that as hard code, but what we wanted to do what was that we can issue these commands on the fly. So we have a priority queue where these commands come in, they get um, executed one after another, and yeah, this is like what we did. Is this uh, an answer to your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, don't know. I don't know if you already said it and I just didn't listen. I want to buy such a thing, how much do I have to pay? <laughs> um, 
This guy is uh, available, like not for free, but you can buy it if you want for everybody. Um, it comes from uh, Boston Dynamics. It costs around 50,000 francs. I think it's not too much, but it's still really expensive. You can buy a great car with that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have some spare 50,000 bucks, um, yeah, sure, <laughs> feel free. Question there in the back, I guess. Yeah. And then in front here. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, how do you know when to say confirm? What kind of feedback or output do you get? And do you always need the tablet when you speak to the robot? Um, yes and no. So I have a visual output for the robot, which kind of gives me sentences, human readable sentences, and it tells me, hey, I'm going to do this. Is this okay? So during this time, I looked at the screen and see... Other, or yeah, I see what the robot wants to do and then I need to confirm. I can also say, no, don't do it aboard and then you won't do it. Um, I also implemented a text-to-speech synthesizer. However, this did not quite work out really great. Like this was really at the end of this, um, yeah, this, this uh, module I, I visited there during my master. So this was just a, like, yeah, it kind of works sometimes. Um, but the Python speech to text API, uh, text to speech API, the one I found didn't work really great. So there would be some, yeah, improvement when we get this thing to run, uh, so that, that we can actually hear what the robot wants to do. So right now there's only visual clues or readable clues. So you need the tablet all the time. We need a not the tablet but a computer. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's another question here. Yeah. Uh, if the robot or, or the algorithm uh, detects several likely uh, commands that could be meant by, by what you said, can it offer uh, a choice between them? Like, can it ask, did you mean that or that? And you can elect the first or second option? No, actually not, but this is a great idea. So we're probably going to implement that. This is, this is a great idea, yeah. No, but it does not right now. It just outputs a similarity and the command he detected. And when I see, okay, the similarity is, I don't know, 50% of walking and orienting, he won't issue the command. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, hi. Uh, considering that there are fail-safes here, you have to confirm a command before it runs. Um, was there a very conscious choice to not use machine learning? It, for, for which part exactly? For, the, for, um, for parsing the input itself. Of course, speech to text, you did use it. Yeah. For instead of TFIDF, if you'd used a neural network, you would have better NLP capabilities. The problem would be the issue of bad parsing and getting bad commands. But since you already have a fail safe of, I will only confirm the command and then it runs, wouldn't it be still safe? And was there some reason to not use neural networks at that point? Yes, uh, safety wasn't a problem. The problem was actually that we didn't have a big enough data set to train a language model to extract our commands because, as I said, there's not many ways to issue commands to the robot. And to train a model like a deep neural network that actually manages to extract this information on these commands, we need way more data than just three sample sentences per command. So this was the main part why we didn't use natural language processing. Okay, that's fair. You already have answered that. So uh, if I understood correctly, the code is currently running on your laptop, not on the robot itself. Would, would the robot itself have a control system that you can run your own code on, or would you always need to add your own computer to it? Yes, it does. Um, you can see here on the back, maybe, yeah, you don't see it on the picture, but underneath the tower, there's a little computer not the most powerful one. This is why I run all these like, language models on an external computer. But he has the ability to move autonomously. So this, this program I wrote during my bachelor thesis also runs on the so-called spot core, the, the computer on the back. And then we can simply send the commands using uh, yeah, whatever connection we want to use. Ethernet may, might be the, the simplest one. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So one final question there in the back. We will have time in the coffee break to yeah, I think have the lights demo and the, the, the coffee break. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Will the source code be available? You, you, <laughs> your um, code? Yes. The source code is not on GitHub. Uh, we have it in our local repositories, but if you want the source code, you can email me. I can send you the code. Um, yeah. Yeah, not, not, not me right now, but I guess there might be interests also from like all over the world. Yeah. Um, I cite my, my boss right now. He says he doesn't like to upload code to GitHub because then it needs to be maintained. And there are many, for example, pull requests you need to work on. So if you want our code, it's, it's uh, open source. Uh, you just, just need to ask. Yeah, I'll talk to you in private about that. <laughs> okay. All right. So thanks a lot for the awesome demonstration, and we're looking forward to the coffee break. Yep. Yes. Thank you very much.